thanks everyone for coming. Um, my name is Emily Rushton and I'm obviously doing a talk around climate change and the impacts that food have on it and health. Um, my background is in nursing and this is a scientific based presentation. All the facts that you have in here and that I'll be speaking about are from research and they've been quality checked by Ora Tayao, the New Zealand Climate and Health Council, who I'm doing it on behalf of, and also some public health researchers down in Wellington. Um, but it's all inspired from personal experience, and I'll be talking to you about that soon. So if everyone could just pop their phones on silent, um, that would be wonderful. The, I think everybody knows where toilets. If we need fire, we can go up this exit over here. And if you do have any questions, I really encourage you to pop your hand up old school style and ask at the time because I don't want to lose any ideas. Okay? So we're going to quickly go through why I care, why I'm doing this. Um, a little bit about climate, shell, climate change in a nutshell and the issues around um, why um, all of these things interact, um, food, climate change and health. I will, then we'll go into having a low-carbon diet and why it's so beneficial for health, what's happening around the world and in New Zealand, and then how we can actually impact. So I promise you, that is actually me. I know I look significantly different uh, now, um, but I've been around in sort of the unions and things for a little while um, back in the day, and I spent three years in South Auckland nursing in a high an area of really high deprivation um, and so that kind of injustice was always something that I felt really strongly about there and then I ended up going over to the UK taught in the NHS so I worked in the NHS but also taught over there I got a certificate in teaching and it was around adults moving back into work so again it was around sort of the injustice in society and people that are affected disproportionately when I came back to New Zealand, I started planning the trip that I'd always wanted. The, I'd always been, since I was really little, wanted to go explore the world and not to lie on the beach in a bikini, but to really figure out how it worked, um, all the sort of differences and cultures and that kind of thing. And what I didn't realise um, is that actually I was more ethnocentric than I thought. I really didn't realise how Internally, I already had assumed that our culture was doing it better. You know, we had the big buildings, we had the technology, and that we were doing quite well. One of the other things I learned is if a, you're going to go on a trip for two years and only carry on backpack, you really need to color coordinate. So this was in um, in Indonesia, and this particular hill tribe that I trekked up to, um, embraced me fully, we had a wonderful couple of days with them and the children. I just had very little ability to communicate with them. I knew how to count up to 10 so we could play games in, in Barca a little bit with the kids, um, but the amount of interaction, the amount of um, things they shared with me was so beautiful, the way their culture um, looked after each other. So I got a lot from it, but I wasn't able to ask very many questions particularly. And then in uh, a couple of other villages, like this one was in Burma, um, and here was one of the first times where I really was able to talk and understand with the chief because um, the guide that was able to walk us up to the villages had a good knowledge of English and the, the language of that village, which was only spoken in that village. And the chief was taking us around and we were going to all these little houses um, everybody was giving us roasted peanuts or tea or whatever, playing with the children and he was very proud showing us around. And then we went through into where they were growing everything and out onto where the hillsides, where the, the plantations of tea and oranges were. And I was, started just asking normal questions because I had the opportunity. And so I was asking him like, when does he plant things? When, when, do, when do you actually collect them? What was happening? And he very quickly went from being quite proud to quite a concerned face and he said that actually um, his family in this town had been there for generations 
they had always been able to grow and uh, sow and gather, you know, like clockwork. Um, but in the last 15 to 20 years, they had gone from having everything um, very to the T to now it's changing. The, the trees would just blossom randomly, the fruit would then rot and fall because it was the wrong time of year. Um, obviously the climate was having big impacts on um, the, the growth and destroying crops and then there was new diseases that were coming as well. And so he'd gone from being able to supply the surrounding villages as well to not knowing year on year whether they were going to have enough for themselves. And that really upset me. It was the first time that I'd realised that climate change was actually impacting people already. And I went back into the village and was playing with the children and felt really upset that my culture was doing this to them because they hadn't done anything to deserve it. They would nicely sat there and uh, just interacted very um, well with their environment for centuries. So I started researching around how we are impacting and also who has been affected. Um, and it came up the Pacific are being very affected. So our Pacific Islands are um, already having to plan on moving. We've got a Fiji, one Fijian island that's already on the move uh, and whole nations in the Pacific are already having to move. And the Pacific are really part of who I am as a New Zealander as well. So I, I felt really strongly that um, how, you know, how do we not hear about this more? Um, why do people still, are still stuck in the denial phase? And so while I was um, researching as well, I came up around um, animal emissions and how high they were with climate change. Um, I had always thought that if I recycled and you know, took the bus a little bit, I was a, I was a good Kiwi. And it really upset me that by um, eating animal products, I was actually having a really big impact on my whole life up until that point. Um, for 28 years, I was having an impact on people elsewhere to the point where they didn't have food security anymore. And that really upset me that I hadn't had that choice because we weren't talking about it and we didn't know. So climate change in a nutshell, if we think about um, the greenhouse gas effect. So we all sort of understand that we're creating um, kind of like a blanket. So we've lived in this world in a nice little um, balanced ecosystem with a thin blanket above us. The sun's come in and bounced out and kept our balance. What we're doing now is we're taking solid objects from underneath the ground or that's on our earth and we're then basically putting them into gas and increasing that blanket size. So when the light's coming in, it's uh, being trapped and over time we're warming up. What people, um, when they are saying to, you'll hear it around where they're saying, oh, but you know, it happened before. Um, we have got to the same kind of temperatures before, but the rates of gases is much higher and we haven't yet caught up to our um, how thick our blanket is. So even if we stopped creating them now, we are going to continue to warm for quite a while. So it's quite important that we get it under control. And then also animal agriculture is a, a lot more of it, um, has a lot more effect than what we are currently giving it. This is a slide which just shows you the interactions it has on health. So there are huge benefits for us tackling climate change. In a preventative way for medicine as well, we are going to be able to keep our society a lot healthier if we can avoid um, as much climate change as we can. And to keep in mind, we're all organisms, and all organisms need these things to survive. Um, these are all going to be affected with climate change. So it's really, really important. So the main issues is we have this increasing global demand for food. And that's partly because we've got an increasing population, but it's also the way that we are actually using food and creating it and wasting it. A lot of the foods that we are using are quite high in emissions and we can change that. And then the environmental change that is already happening is 
um, having an impact on how the food's produced. And that's what I was seeing on the ground. In Western society especially, we're also having a lot of trouble with the diseases that are created because of what we eat. So it all sounds quite sad, but we also have all of these things can be fixed by one direction, by one, one uh, change in food. And so that's quite exciting to me because quite often, you know, things are a lot more complicated than that. Um, but all of these things, we can just put our energy into one direction, which is why I'm doing what I'm doing now, because I feel like um, if we were talking about it, you know, that we have the, the power to change a lot um, quite quickly. So I've got a video here that I'd like to show you. Um, and it's just about four minutes long. is obviously taking statistics from um, around the world, not specifically from New Zealand. And around the world, like 90% of the world's soy is fed to animals, 
even if you think about how much soy is sort of tofu and things like that is eaten in Asia, 90% of it um, is actually fed to animals. And it's one of the main leading causes of Amazon destruction. Um, so you can think actually, if we weren't feeding animals all these things, we would actually be able to feed the world many times over. How uh, it's relevant in New Zealand is that because of the way we use land, but also um, we import 51% or over half anyway of, of the world's palm kernel to feed our cattle. The next biggest importer of palm kernel in the world is the entire of Europe put together. And so, and we take that from Indonesia and Malaysia, and we, uh, in that way, uh, directly linked to destruction there. So for an example, if we had a piece of land, you can use kgs or whatever you like in this case, 250 uh, pounds of beef, it takes the exact same amount of land to create 50,000 kgs of tomatoes, 53,000 kgs of potatoes. You know, we can make huge amounts of vegetables from the same land. And when I was driving, uh, I've been doing my talks around New Zealand now for a couple months, and everywhere I go, it's just farms for animals. And we could be using that land in a very different way. We could reforest part of it, you know, in carbon credits. We could do lots of different things with it. At the moment, it's being very misused for very small amounts of um, what we get out of it. And by, uh, this is like World Health Statistics, by the end of the century, we're going to have almost half the world, basically half the world's going to be in a severe food shortage if we keep going in the way that we're going. Already some of our main staples are being affected. And if you think about um, how fluctuations in price of main food types are going to affect um, the poor, basically, um, a lot quicker than anyone else. And so I think it's around taking responsibility as well. You know, as I was traveling, people would tell me how amazing Kiwis were when they came here. And we are, we are people that care about others, that, you know, we would offer them to go to their house and have a shower and give them food and that kind of thing. We are caring, we do care. We just don't understand and haven't made the connection yet. It's a fact that we often, when we're talking about climate change and emissions, we say we're too small, we won't make a difference, and we point our finger over at China. That seems to be our fallback position. Actually, New Zealand has the biggest carbon footprint. We are in the top of the 5%. We are always uh, regularly in the top 10 emitters in the entire world per person. And so we need to be thinking about that and taking responsibility for it because we are affecting others and that's not fair. And at the moment, we are still growing. Our emissions are still going up. We're also in the bottom 10 in the world regularly for what we're doing about it. So Aotearoa, the New Zealand Climate and Health Council, have four things that they're trying to tackle that co-benefit in health. Obviously, um, there's only three up here, but one of them is also coal, which has been left off. So trying to stop um, coal being used. So we've got increasing active transport like walking and biking, but also public transports. We've got um, improving housing around insulation and energy efficiently, efficiency. And then the one that I'm talking about around moving our population to a more plant-based diet because of lowering emissions and how many health benefits that we can gain for, for our population. And we're not the only ones trying to do something about it. This month, um, the Netherlands, who are already quite forward-thinking around this, they've changed their new one is saying that we should only be eating meat twice a week. And only one of those should be red meat. New Zealand's at the moment is saying um, no more than 500 grams of red meat per week per person. Um, but the Netherlands is now the, the first one to be quite hard limit and, and um, quite progressive there. Italy, UK also um, do, and there's quite a few others but I can't put them all on the slide. 
And the USA is actually been decreasing the amount of animals that they've been consuming by 10% year on year since 2007. And that makes me really excited. Like if they can do it, we can totally do it, right? So animal agriculture is 18% of the world's emissions. Transport on the other hand is 14%. And that includes planes. So it's a lot higher. It also uses masses amount of our resources, and as you saw, we don't get as much out of it. So if you're looking at how much um, protein we can get from plants from the same amount of resources, you're getting six times the amount, okay? This is a nice pretty picture, but actually um, is a bit old. So the percentage of New Zealand's emissions as of last year is now 51%. We only have, it's only 3.7% of our GDP. And that money that it's creating is not in any way um, mitigated for the amount of environmental impacts it has. So the, the rivers and things that are around farms, only 97% of them can be, uh, sorry, only 3% of them can be swum in. 97% are completely um, really poisoned actually. And the, the research that's been done is showing that we can only sustainably use, even if we put all of our environmental um, strategies in place around our farms, we can only actually keep 30% of the animals on there viably. So we need to reduce them by 70% or it's going to happen anyway whether we like it or not. So the, when we're looking at food, 30% of the emissions come from wasted food. So that's talking about when we are creating them on a farm, uh, everything's growing there and we get these ugly ones. And we're just going, oh, we don't want a carrot that's got three legs. Um, but then we've got the ugly food movement that's happening and that's quite exciting. Um, it's going to make things cheaper as well. And then once it gets to the supermarket, we also throw things out there. Um, we throw a lot of stuff out there actually. But France has introduced legislation to make sure that those vegetables and, and produce goes to homeless people or shelters that it's not thrown out and that's something that we could be doing. And then in the home, um, the statistics are that in a Western society we actually throw away quite a lot as well. The, the, the stats in America are around 45% of what people buy they throw away. And we're, we're not far off. If you look at um, types of food, so out of everything we're eating, 80% of the emissions come directly from animal products, 9% is from rice, and this is the only exception when you're talking about a low carbon diet, it's the only uh, one that's really high from um, plants. It's, so it's only from wetland rice, rice that's grown in paddy fields. You can grow rice on hills, but I haven't figured out yet which ones are which. Um, so I tend to start swapping out and using, I'm using um, pearl barley a lot, and you can make rice salads and all sorts of things um, out of pearl barley, and it's grown in New Zealand, and quite cheap. Um, so if you think about it, we are pretty much feeding the world. If you think about how many people eat meat in the world, in other countries, 11% is the rest. If you take away meat and dairy, basically, 11% um, and rice, 11% is everything else we're making. So we can considerably reduce our emissions there. Now I've got a friend that goes dumpster diving every now and again, and I was very skeptical about what I would find. So one night, a couple weeks ago, I went along to see what was there, and I thought for sure most everything's going to be mouldy, you're going to be picking out the tiniest little things. And that wasn't the case at all. We have entire bins outside pretty much every facility that was filled with things that were still edible. There were only a couple of things that were kind of mouldy. Some of the melons were a little bit off, but we got enough food in one trip to feed 12 people over an entire weekend. And it really was quite sickening at the time, um, especially because the bins are filled with all of the food that's in there is all edible. So you're not even touching things that were disgusting. Um, so it was a real shame. 
Uh, these are some pictures from another one that he, he did as well. Um, so it's something that we could actually make a big impact on if we change that legislation. So this is just showing New Zealand is in the, the top category for waste. One way of looking at it, something that you can um, easily remember, is that a kg of beef is about the same as 100 kilometres of driving. These stats come from New Zealand Beef and Lamb website, so they might be a little bit light, but they're easy to remember. And when you're talking about um, beef, lamb, uh, deer and goat are fairly similar. So moving on to sort of goat's milk um, is not going to change anything. So there's a UK study done recently where they got people to do food diaries. And these food diaries, um, over the course of around about a week, um, showed you know, how much emissions were in everybody's food, what they uh, were eating. What they then did is after they had calculated everyone's emissions, they put them in groups. So they had the vegetarian, the, the plant-based diet is the V, the tiny one at the bottom. And then everyone else was put into groups of you know, one-fifth of emissions, the higher they went up. And that's why they go up nicely. The, the two bars is because one is ex what they would normally eat and one is what they actually ate. Okay, so you can see here the huge difference uh, in diet. So there's a huge ability for us to do that um, reduction. What they also did was they then used uh, an analysis modeling to try and figure out if we, if we were swapping what foods, how um, would it react? And they were able to show that a 40% reduction is quite realistic without changing the culture quite so much. So we don't have to go from having a sausage to having lentils, um, but having like, you know, a transition into healthier, uh, more whole foods type places, structuring and replacing like for like in a lot of areas can make a big difference as well. We've also got local research that's been saying the same thing, that it's cheaper, um, it's healthier, and it's lower on emissions. And so they went further to say, you know, if that's the case, why are our institutions not embracing this yet? And that's where we talk about health professionals as well. We need to be moving this into our prisons and our hospitals. Some new research just recently has also said that if we just halved the meat that we were consuming, that we would actually save a lot of lives and emissions year on year. So, Currently our diets are giving us a lot of diseases. The, some of the latest research actually turns on our head what we've been thinking about meat and animal products. And so it's quite confronting for a lot of us. It took me a long time to feel comfortable coming and talking to everybody and I needed um, other people to, you know, these other researchers to give me this, you know, to feel confident that these are correct because it's not what we've been told. So. Last year we had um, the World Health Organization say yes, red meat is cancerous and also um, processed meat is obviously the worst. So a lot of people know about that one but there was a milk cohort which was done over 23 years in Austria with a huge amount of people and what it showed is that the more milk you drink, the shorter your life expectancy and that was because it caused um, heart disease and cardiovascular problems but also cancers as well. It also had a very significant increase in fracture rates in women but we don't know whether that could have been the woman going to the doctors being told that they were at risk and the doctor then at the time thinking go and drink milk. We don't know that. Interestingly it didn't have any in men. The other really interesting um, studies, we have always studied iron as a whole, but iron's actually different in animals than it is in plants. So we have heme iron that is from animals and non-heme iron from plants. In meat we actually have 40% is from heme, but we actually get 60% of it is actually the plant from what they've been eating. So the studies now, when, now that they're looking at it differently, is showing that Iron from meat causes an increase in cardiovascular disease, diabetes, stroke, dementia, metabolic disorder, and some you know, other ones as well. 
And their heme, um, iron, is the one that as health professionals we've been telling people that they need. When they're low in iron, we've been saying, go and have red meat, you need to eat red meat. But we need to be looking at foods now more as a package of what they can give us. Because yes, you can get some of those nutrients from these foods, but they come with a lot of baggage. And that's not good for our populations. We're already having health crises with a lot of these problems. So we don't want to be adding to them. Uh, we can get all of those same nutrients from plants without any of those baggage. And they also, the plants will give us a lot of protection. For example, when I first came to New Zealand, um, back, back to New Zealand, um, my mum was very excited because she didn't really understand what a plant-based diet was about. Um, she was a little bit concerned about how she was going to help and, and cook for me and things like that when she wanted to. But she had, there was a, um, an article in the Healthy Food magazine around how much iron was in tofu. And my mum's a doctor and I'm a nurse and I was scratching my head going, how can that be? Because it's not green and leafy and it's not red meat. So where's the iron coming from? Um, so we don't actually have a good education around iron actually being in plants because tofu has more iron in it than meat. And I was making, this is Jamie Oliver's mousse recipe, and it does have a little bit of sugar in it, but I was making this tofu and realizing that I was, sorry, this mousse, realizing I was having more iron in my dessert than I was having if I was having a steak. And that kind of blew my mind a little bit. So we just need a little bit more um, knowledge around where we can get things. So a lot of people are concerned about soy, so I just like to talk about that for a little bit. There was one study a long time ago that um, showed in rats who had breast cancer already, when they ate soy, the cancer got a little bit bigger. That has never been replicated and there's been no other studies and nothing in humans that shows that soy is detrimental. The only thing it has shown is that it reduces cancer rates. It doesn't do anything else, it's not a super food, but it is, it's just a bean, it is good for us, okay? Uh, protein and iron are a lot easier to get than people think. Protein is pretty much in everything and most people are getting far too much of it. Um, and iron these days, the studies that are coming out in our modern living, if you're, it doesn't really matter which diet you're on, most people that are gonna get anemic, who are our childbearing female age, um, are gonna get anemic on almost any diet. There's, it's pretty much like that now. So, um, and if you were talking about like those diseases that were linked to the heme iron, they have no link to supplemental iron. So if you do need to take a supplement, you're not at risk of any of those diseases and it is far less in emissions to have that. And plant-based diets are cheaper. A lot of people are concerned that they need to go to the health food shop and buy the things on the top shelf to be able to be a vegetarian or something like that. But there's a reason why our uh, poor countries don't eat a lot of meat. It's because it's expensive. So here what I normally would do is we would get um, you to have a think about practically applying this in your life. Well, what I'd like to do for timing because we're um, talking for the video um, is think about the, the, the meals that you really enjoy and then Google them. When you go home, Google vegan bolognese or um, vegan chocolate cake or whatever you like because there is ways to make absolutely everything um, without any animal products. And when you are talking to other people or you are looking at yourself, it's really important that we don't say tomorrow, okay, I need to be completely um, animal free because it's a process it took me even though every day I still have those children with me from Burma I have a huge motivation um, to change but it still took me 10 months to move from eating meat to slowly reduce my meat and then start looking at other things in my diet it took me a month to move away from milk you know those um, Doing it that way makes it less stressful. It makes it an explorative, exciting move, not, um, not scary. Um, because I'm a foodie, I love food. And actually now, I'm able to experiment a lot more 
um, and have had some of the best food I've ever had. So some of the things you can do is perhaps like um, meatless kind of every second day or, or even if you just did it once a week just so that you have um, one thing that you want to try and start exploring with until you get more comfortable with things. And joining a plant-based interest group is really um, helpful. So while I was overseas, I joined the New Zealand vegetarian group for a while and then the, the vegan group online, a Facebook group. And that, I was a little bit worried because I thought they were meant to be quite scary. Um, but it turned out they were very friendly. And even though I wasn't there yet, I was able to ask them lots of questions and I could see lots of recipes and everybody was posting things. Um, and now I am in New Zealand, I've gone to things like potlucks and those have given me heaps of food for thought. You, go, um, you can go along and see all the ways that you can actually um, cook and all the things that you can eat and it's uh, very exciting and it's a really good support. And you want to always talk about things in a really positive way. So New Zealand has, we have this um, culture where meat is very dominant and if we don't eat meat we're not strong or manly or you know. Um, so I think it's, it's really important that if we are at a barbecue or even if we're just in our own family to keep talking about things in a positive way rather than sort of doom and gloom because we can, you know, we can make a really big change and people will come on board with that. Um, if we only were looking at someone who was really upset and angry, we wouldn't want to be like them, right? So it's a way of embodying the change that we want them to see and be a part of. And we can do it. The world has done some really amazing things together. And the amount of impact that changing our food system could have, and just even the small changes that you can make in your own lives, is going to make a really big difference. So it's really exciting. Some of the, the big things that people ask me about is what are we then going to do about our farms? So currently, I think most people are aware, our farmers are in a really bad state. They, are, uh, they increased a lot of debt over the last sort of 15 years, um, but it didn't increase their money. And now we've got a lot of droughts and different things that have um, happened, and they're getting the low money coming out from, from the dairy payouts. Um, so we have a lot of farms for sale that aren't being sold. We've got a lot of farmers having to destock their farms. They're in a really bad way. What I've been trying to um, talk to people around is supporting our farmers to move into something that's more sustainable. So economically, we've got big um, top economists in the world saying that animal industry is the next coal. It's the next thing that people are going to start divesting from and not wanting a part of when they realize how much it's impacting us. So it's not good for us to be using up all of our land space and only 3.7% of our GDP um, on something that's going to collapse. And it already is very unsustainable. So moving into, um, we have, this James Cameron is obviously a big famous director. He bought up some land north of Wellington and he's turned it into Organics Farm, which year on year is expanding because of the need. We've also, I know personally of ones that have um, gone into hazelnuts, avocados, hemp and tea. We're exporting tea to China. We've got soybeans grown in the Waikato making our own tofu. And down in Southland, they're actually reclaiming some of those dairy lands and turning them back into oats, which was what they used to be. And they're going to be making oat milk specifically from them. So we've got a lot of really positive things that are happening and I want to really um, encourage people to support farmers to move into these sustainable areas rather than sort of leaving them out to dry because that's not going to be helpful to us either. So have a think about um, what we could do locally, perhaps in your community, in your family, school. Some people um, have talked about meatless Mondays in their work getting people to sign up so that um, it was kind of like a pledge thing. Some people have wanted to be doing um, potlucks that they might already do with their friends, but doing like a, an eco thing. And so to get everyone to do vegetarian dishes for a bit. Um, others have talked about gardening initiatives because the more fresh produce that you have in your fridge, you're gonna use that rather than more processed um, things. And the more processed something is, 
you're also you're going to have more emissions associated. So Ora Taiao, um, the New Zealand Health and Climate Council, what it does, it does a lot of support and advocacy, but it also a lot of like public submissions and things on behalf of people. Um, if you are looking at wanting to, in your institution or anything, have support around how you could reduce your climate footprint, um, you can get in touch with us. Um, and we have a lot of links with other international um, agencies as well. And I just want to leave you here with the saying that everyone here has the sense that right now is one of the moments that we're influenced in the future. And on my talks around New Zealand, this is what I've been feeling. The amount of times um, in the groups that everybody has wanted more information, been really excited, they've networked and come up with ideas to move forward. Um, there is a movement happening and thank you for having me and thank you for being a part of it.